I, uh, that Earth, Wind, and Fire leadoff there it makes me want to sing a little a cappella, but I don't think that's what you wanted to hear, is it? So I'll dispense with that. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Dave Whitmore. I'm a senior education strategist at E-Trade, where I spend much of my time talking to folks like you at events like this, but also at uh, the events that we do uh, for E-Trade customers around the country as well. We do large-scale education days. Matter of fact, from here, we're going to Newport Beach, and we're going to be doing one in Costa Mesa, Weston. Um, an education day at E-Trade is free for our customers. It's always in some convention type hotel. We start off with continental breakfast. We've got one room focused on stock trading, one focused on option trading, one focused on retirement type investing. Five sessions a day, three rooms, lots of stuff, nice lunch during the day. Big commitment to education that, that E-Trade is, is making and it's going to become even bigger. So if you're a current E-Trade customer and you're not familiar with the, our education circuit, chat with us afterwards. Be happy to fill you in if you're not an E-Trade customer and you're not getting stuff like that, then think about E-Trade. So let's do our topic here, ETFs. I'm, uh, I've spoken about ETFs at the Money Show and at the Traders Expo going back probably a decade now. It was the first time I ever made a presentation on ETFs and at that time they were brand new. Um, and in one sense they were brand new and they were very plain vanilla at the time. And they're not so plain vanilla anymore. Um, but, the, but the landscape has evolved enormously and in, 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 in ways that gives us a great set of benefits as investors and or traders. So my somewhat rhetorical question is, for investors or for traders, um, I'll, uh, I'll give you my opinion on that when we get to the end. Um, let me just cover the important disclosure slide briefly. The most important aspect of this, dis of this slide is that what I'm talking to you about today is not advice. And I, I know you hear that a lot, but I want to underscore this point a little bit. I can't give you advice because to give you advice, I have to speak with you personally. I have to understand your financial situation. I have to understand what other investments you might have. So it would be disingenuous of me to suggest that by listening to me talk here, you should take that as advice or guidance. I am going to make reference to trading strategies or investment strategies or the way people use these things as education and context. It's up to you to take it to that next step. So let's get, in, let's get going. So my question starting off was for investors or for traders, and so I want to start off by hearkening back to uh, an advertising campaign that was popular when I was young. I'm showing my age to the audience here. But the jingle or the ad was, it's two, two, two mints in one. The little tapping of the, of the mint candy, if you'll recall, the product was certs. And the argument that was being made, or the, the position that was being made, was that certs was a breath mint and a candy mint. It was two, two, two mints in one. My point here is ETFs are like two mints in one. They are breath mints and they are candy mints. But what I mean is they are trading vehicles that can be used in a very speculative short-term way if you're inclined to do that, and they can be portfolio components. They fit perfectly well as a slice of the proverbial pie that we talk about when we're diversified. And it is because of these two things that their popularity has soared. So let's talk about, I, I gotta set the ground rules or, the, or the, some, of the, some of the nomenclatures first. So ETFs give us the benefits of exchange traded funds and the convenience of stocks. And this is very, contrasts very sharply with mutual funds. Mutual funds don't give us the convenience that, that the stock structure gives us. When we're in ETFs, we generally find investments with low annual expense ratios. Probably one of the single most important elements of a long-term investment success is keeping your annual investment expenses low. I'm sure many of you know that. You've heard it. It's a drumbeat that's been in this industry for a long time. ETFs fit that perfectly well because they are of the index fund structure. When you own one of these instruments, you know exactly what's in it because what's in it is the index that is tracking. This is different than mutual funds. 
Mutual funds, you only sort of directionally know what's in there. And you also get a high correlation to the particular, to, to the index that's being tracked. Now, the, the tradability elements of it are that they trade during market hours, they're quoted with a bid and an ask, just like a stock when you quote it. You can use all the same order types to trade an index, an ETF. You can use stop orders, limit orders, market orders, market on close orders. You can trade in extended hours. All of that functionality that comes along with stocks is available in ETFs. And that is, none of that is available in the mutual fund structure. So that's part of the story of why these have become so popular, because of this structural way that they're set up. Now, there's some, there is some architecture in there that, that we're going to talk about a little bit because I want you to understand how the benefits that we get from this structure come about to us. So first, though, let's talk a little bit about this idea of index funds. So what's an index? An index is very simply a measurement of a group of stocks. We use it to describe market performance. It allows us to compare investments. How did I do? How did I do versus the S&P? So this idea of an index, which is sometimes called a benchmark, was originally created with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The Dow is not truly like most of the other indexes, though, because it's what's called price-weighted. All other indexes, ever since Standard & Poor's came about years after Dow and created the S&P 500, are generally done with what's called capitalization weighting. What this does is it makes the big companies carry more weight in the index calculation. Price weighting, like the Dow, simply means that the big priced stocks carry a big impact on the, on the index. And that's sort of an arbitrary figure. So that's why this idea of capitalization weighting has come into this idea of these indexes. And this is important because there's a whole slew of ETFs that have arisen that don't use capitalization weighting. And that changes the outcome of those indexes. And that's one of the pitfalls that we're going to look at in a few minutes here. One last thing, you can't invest directly in an index, but you can invest in index funds who simply seek to replicate the performance. So then we have this topic called a stock index fund. Stock index funds are baskets of stocks where the manager simply mirrors the holding of the index. The, uh, this was popularized in the, in the 1960s by the work, by work on the efficient market hypothesis where many, many uh, uh, academic investors suggested that the way to be invested in the stock market is to simply own the market, to not, to not bother with trying to pick stocks, but to just be invested in U.S. stocks by owning the S&P 500. And so that, the popularity of what's called passive investing came about. So they hold the same weights, they hold the same positions, and therefore they deliver the performance of that index. That's an index fund. Traditional index funds were done just like mutual funds, where you send your check into the mutual fund, it goes in, it gets executed at the end of the day, um, and, but now they're in this tradable function. I talked about expense ratios to just give you a, a, a relative understanding of the comparison here. Open-ended funds is the term for traditional mutual funds. A typical expense ratio is about 1%. That means uh, uh, that, that's, uh, it's about $100 a year if you have $10,000 invested in it. So if you have $10,000 invested in a 1% in expense ratio fund, you're paying $100 a year. You don't see that charge. It doesn't show up in your statement. It comes out of your performance. You're paying $100 a year. That's for $10,000. If you have $100,000, it's 10 times that that you're paying. Expense ratios are important. Open-ended index funds, about a half a percent. Exchange-traded funds, less than that. And then the, the least expensive of the ETF world are down to 0.1%. We're talking uh, minimal amounts per $10,000, a buck. So. Um, uh, this idea of, a, of the expense ratio is crucial, and when you use ETFs, particularly when you focus on the lower cost ones, you are right there in the lowest cost vehicles that are available. So that's one of the reasons why they're extremely popular. The other benefit, as I, as I extend this a little bit, one of the beauties 
of, of ETFs is that you have access to basically the full menu of asset classes that are available. So I've got domestic foreign stocks, large cap, small cap, growth, value, developed markets, emerging markets, in the bond universe, in the fixed income universe. There are domestic bond ETFs, foreign bond ETFs, government, corporate, high yield, long, uh, high uh, uh, junk, um, long term, short term, all of the classic asset classes that we use to make the pie are available in an ETF form. And you can find an ETF that maps directly to an asset class that you are allocating into. So uh, it, if I continue on my little um, uh, image here, there are also alternative asset classes that are available. So commodities can be tracked with ETFs. You can invest in real estate. And there are even, and I've got down here, active strategies. That's kind of a reference to the world of hedge funds and where hedge funds can be considered a separate asset class if you have a sufficient wealth. There are ETF vehicles that mimic the behaviors of hedge funds. So if you're, if you're at that stage, you can even extend out a little further into that world. And so that allows you to build the pie. And so this is one of the first and, and most common uses of ETFs. Here you go. Let's say you had an asset allocation that said, I'm going to be 40% large cap stocks, 20% US small stocks, X% percent foreign, X% percent fixed income. You can directly map an ETF to those, and you there have a low cost, passive, indexed portfolio allocated according to whatever model you've used to arrive at that. So in the, in the most plain vanilla way, and we're not, we haven't talked about any of the active trading stuff, ETFs just fit perfectly into the pie manufacturing. People also use them to make focused bets or to make positions on sectors, to play sector rotation because all of the major sectors are represented by ETFs. So there's the basic materials, there's industrials, there's energy, there's technology. All of the key classic sector are represented by ETFs, all with, with attractive uh, uh, annual expense ratios. I can even drill down into some very obscure stuff if I want. So I just took a look at the healthcare sector here, and I used the E-Trade screener, and I said, show me, show me ETFs that are in the healthcare sector, and then I went through and I looked for the various industries that were represented within that group. First, I'll draw your attention to the four on the left, medical devices, healthcare providers, pharmaceuticals, and biotechnology. Kind of, those are the groups that we all know about. Biotech can get a little thorny, we know, but healthcare providers, large pharma, we understand these, these, these industries, sort of if we're involved in the market to, to any sort of a degree. But the ones on the right is a different story. The genomic revolution, biotech clinical trials, healthcare momentum, I'm just showing you to show you that there are examples, even when you go into something as plain vanilla as show me healthcare, there are some industry ETFs in there that have very specialized roles, very specialized focuses, some of which you might not even be capable of fully appreciating, like genomic revolution. So are these the right instruments? I'm going to suggest that they're probably not, that there's probably not a reason for you to be using an ETF on the genomic revolution. If you have knowledge in that industry, that's one thing, um, but it, it's, my point here is it's no longer an asset class. It's now almost down to picking a stock, and that's something to be very careful of and to not stumble into the idea that, oh, I'm in healthcare. You're in a very specialized niche area, and that's one of the examples of what can happen with ETFs. ETFs are also designed, some of them, as trading vehicles. And here's where we're going to see the first uh, of two kinds that are for traders, two or three kinds that are for traders, not for investors. Here's an example of what's called a leveraged ETF. So a leveraged ETF is simply managed to produce two or three times the performance of a basic index. So here I have uh, the S&P 500 in orange, 
and the blue line is the ProShares Ultra S&P 500. So that's a two times leveraged ETF that tracks the S&P 500. And what you can see is that, guess what? It's more volatile than, uh, than, than uh, its, its partner there. There are also inverse. So here's the same exact thing, but upside down. So here, the, uh, the blue line is the S&P 500, and the green line is the short S&P 500, double leveraged. So not only does it move opposite, but it moves twice the rate with twice the volatility. These are designed for traders. I'm gonna show you an inherent flaw with these shortly. But let's get into the, the mechanics here. How does this arise? So one of the nice things is that you usually benefit from the structure that ETFs have, and I'm gonna say usually because there are some problems here. So first off, how do we price and, and trade mutual funds? In a traditional mutual fund, it undergoes what's called a continuous new offering. When you buy shares in a mutual fund, you are issued new shares by the fund. When you sell your shares in the mutual fund, you redeem those and those shares are canceled. And it's continuously issuing new shares to new investors and redeeming them from investors. That's the way a traditional mutual fund works. And it only prices itself at the end of the day of the trading day. So you place an order at 1 p.m. I'm sorry. Uh, West Coast time, you place an order at 10 a.m. and you know at 1 p.m. Pacific time what, what you bought the shares at. There's also another variation called a closed end fund. Some of you may remember, yes, I'm old enough to remember this, that back at a certain point, and I'm gonna say the 90s, the early 90s, um, the Japan fund and the Germany fund, which were closed end funds, became all the rage and everybody wanted to invest in Japan and Germany because it was believed that the US economy was falling behind the world. And there weren't a lot of vehicles that allowed trading of this, but JPN and GER became outrageously popular and a crazy thing happened. The price, the value of the shares of the fund were trading at three times the value of the stocks that they held. So JPN was 30 bucks, the Japan fund. And each share that was 30 bucks a share in the open market held $10 worth of stock in Japan. So you were buying $10 worth of Japanese stocks for 30 bucks. Why? The greater fool theory? I don't know. I mean, people were buying it at 30 because they thought they could sell it at 32 tomorrow. They were, they were disconnected from the reality of it, of this idea that there's this net asset value of the shares of the instrument in a mutual fund, and they disconnected. So closed-end funds, which were really popular for a while, fell out of favor. And then in 92, the first ETF was created. The S&P 500, the SPY, was the, was the first one. And it emerged in 1992. And it was the creation structure, it was the structure that gave us the benefit of, one, tracking the underlying index, that nice correlation to the index, two, letting us trade it intraday and keeping our expenses low. So how does that work? Well, it's a little complicated. So in an ETF, the shares are created and then sold, or purchased and then redeemed on the fly by professional market makers with, with high-powered computers. And here's how it works. At any given time, if I'm a market maker on the SPY, I might be standing there saying, okay, I'm 105 bid offered at 106, and I'm just using numbers. And if you come in and say, oh, I wanna buy 1,000 at 106, maybe I don't even actually hold those. But what I can do, as soon as you give me that, I can go, okay, and I run my computer program, and it buys all 500 stocks in the right proportion, so for 1,000 shares, I then, my computer program then packages those shares into shares of the ETF. Behind the scenes, the shares get delivered to the fund company. The fund company gives me the shares of the SPY, and then I sell them to you. If you want to sell yours, I buy them from you, I immediately disaggregate the, them into the shares of stock, sell all the stocks in the open market, and, and that's how I've made the trade. Now why would they do that? Well, a couple of things happen here. One, it introduces an arbitrage opportunity. So that professional investor is making fractions of a penny 
on that trade or has the capability of making fractions of a penny. So that brings the economic interest in them making a market in this. But what it does is it holds the bid and the ask very tight to the value of the fund, to the NAV, because there's this built-in arbitrage where if price strays at all, there's an automatic incentive for me to sell the fund and buy the components, or buy the fund and then sell the components, and that forces the price so that it tracks the NAV, and therefore, and the NAV is the index. So this instrument, which is trading in the open market with our bids and offers, never can go very far away from the index that it's tracking. So this structure gives us the benefit of this close correlation or cro close trackability to the index and lets us trade it in and out every day. So it tracks the index performance, which makes it a perfect instrument for our portfolio. And it tracks the instrument, but also lets us buy and sell, so it makes it a great trading vehicle. And it does not collide with either, either of the roles. The trader can use it perfectly efficiently. The investor can use it perfectly efficiently. I go till 115, is that right? Anybody know? Um, so here's just a, a, uh, a chart that illustrates as pri if price wanders away too far from that NAV, and my chart here is showing fractions of a penny in value, but if the premium drifts far enough away, then this, then this arbitrage process can kick in and bring the price back to it. And so the result is something that looks like this. So here is the bars are the trading in the SPY, and the red line is the, uh, is the S&P index. And as you'll see that as the index value goes up and down over time, trading in that ETF hugs it around and follows it as it goes around, even, um, even without active trading by you. Um, so that's how this all came about, but unfortunately, as great as it sounds, when markets are stressed, a lot of this breaks down. And my guess is that you will remember what happened on uh, August 21st of last year. Here's XLV. This is the healthcare, healthcare S&P uh, S&P sector fund. And on Friday, the XLV closed at 71.70. So on Friday, we had a 71.70 close on XLV. Over that weekend, markets got very rattled. And on Monday, XLV opened at 67.39, down 6%, a big drop for sure. But within minutes, it traded down 20%. Within minutes, and it was down 20%. We're gonna do a little case study on this. We're gonna go back, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna go back and we're gonna show you what happened that day and it will reveal some of these issues with, ET, with ETFs. So, with that as background, now let me go through and point out five things about ETFs that you must know. If you're, if you're, if you're scanning the universe for exchange traded funds, if you're looking for an idea for a trading, for a trade, or for an investment pie, slice of the pie, look out for these things. So the first is that not all indexes are created equally or equal. And that's what I talked about before. Remember, we talked about this idea of market cap weighting, which is the standard way of weighting an index. Um, but there are a lot of new variations to indexing that have come on the, the horizon. And you want to you make sure that you're looking out for these buzzwords. So the first is to, to look out for equal weighting. An equal weight gives every stock in the index the same weight as opposed to being weighted by its capitalization. I'm gonna show you an energy ETF to illustrate the differences that show up on this. You'll also see what's called fundamental weighting. This is sometimes called smart beta or smart weighting. You hear a lot of fund companies talking about this. Wisdom Tree is the initial innovator in this space. Wisdom Tree created an index that instead of weighting, I'll use the S&P 500 again, Instead of using the S&P 500 and weighting it by their capitalization, the biggest companies providing the most weight in the index, they weight the companies in the index calculation by their dividends, but not by their dividend yield. So this is not high yield. They weight it by 
the number of shares outstanding times the dividend rate. So the weight that it gets is the total cash that it pays out in dividends. So the companies that are shelling out large amounts of dollars to their shareholders and distributing shares to shareholders get bigger weight in the wisdom tree dividend weighted fund. Main lesson here is it's different than the S&P 500. It's gonna perform differently. So it's not the same exact animal. Whether it's good or bad, you make that decision. And if you're interested in reading more about the logic behind these, the Wisdom Tree website, if you go to wisdomtree.com, they've got some white papers on there. If you wanna read about the argument for what they call smart, what is becoming known as smart beta, check it out. You can, you can read, the, read the information there. Um, and then you're also gonna see currency hedged. This was a home run trade in the last couple of years if you bought Europe but hedged the euro out of it. That's, that ETF performed enormously because of the degrading value of the euro that was happening as the dollar strengthened. So it was a great trade then. It hasn't been more recently. Whether you want to hedge out currency or not is a very important decision to make. Some would argue that adding that decision of whether to hedge out the currency in some foreign market or not is just overcomplicating things. And that if you're gonna be invested in an asset class that's outside of the US, you should be invested in it for what it is. Again, an argument for another day. But let me, let's just look at a couple of examples of, of some of these uh, to illustrate. So here's looking at cap weight, capitalization weight, versus equal weight. So on the left is XLE. That's the, uh, the iShares uh, uh, S&P Energy, um, uh, uh, not the iShares, the Spider. Um, and then the one on the right, ticker symbol RYE, is a Guggenheim equal weight ener energy. So first off, notice that in the case of the uh, XLE on the left, the top stock is ExxonMobil with 18% of the value. Nearly 20% is in one stock. Number two is, is Chevron with 14%. So those two stocks alone are a third of the value of the index. So pretty much you own XLE, you're pretty much getting the performance of Exxon and Chevron. And if I throw in Schlumberger there, now you're up to 40%. So this happens to be a sector that is just massively dominated by a couple of, by a couple of names. Um, other sectors are not that way. Other sectors are more diverse across them. But if you take a look at the Guggenheim equal weight, notice that the top one, uh, One Oak, um, is 3% of assets, then Southwestern Energy is 2.98, Consul Energy 2.79. Um, there is little drifts, so even though they're not actually uh, exact right now, they periodically rebalance it like once a month, and then everything goes back to probably, it's probably 2.5%, and then some of them outperform, so it drifts. But, Exxon is down here in the 10th spot, only making up 2.6%. What do you think this results in? What it results in is, is performance that is much more volatile than the XLE. That could be good, it could be bad. If you're making a bet that you think oil is gonna rise, these types of companies tend to be more responsive to the price of oil, but by the same token, they also decline more rapidly. And here's just another x-ray of this. On the left is the XLE. And if you look at that pie chart of the, of the giant capitalization and large capitalization, 77% of this portfolio is large cap or higher, but large cap, 77%. In the equal weight, if I add medium and small together, 63% of the portfolio is medium or small companies. So, they're both energy, they're both ETFs, they're both tracking the sector, but they're very different animals. And they're, they're, they're to be used sparingly and perhaps more as a trading vehicle than as an investment vehicle. Because this is one of the results that you'll see. Um, this is the decline in, in the energy group uh, accompanied by the decline in crude oil over the past however long it's been declining. The, the black is the XLE, and the green is the equal weight. And as you can see, it's just, it's, it's more volatile and it gets hurt more when the fundamentals of that industry are dragging things down. So that's one of the first curveballs that you wanna make sure you look out for. The second one is that time matters. 
Think back for a moment what I was talking about, about how ETFs are created. This, this creation process where a market maker can buy all the stocks in an index, package them into the shares of the fund, get, sell the shares of the fund, or buy the shares of the fund, disaggregate them, and sell them to stocks. That process is very important to how they track their index. So what happens when the underlying market that we're tracking is not in the US? Well, it's a whole different ball game. So if you were to take a look at, for instance, here's China. One of the things that you will notice on this chart is that there are gaps. There are chart gaps all over the place where price jumps from a closing price on one day down to an opening price meaningfully different on the next day. You'll also notice that they're, that they're generally narrow ranges. This is a result of the fact that the stocks that are in that index are closed. They're Chinese companies. Their markets are closed, yet there are people trading the ETF here. So there are market makers that are making markets in it, but they can't readily arbitrage that out. They can't readily create the shares. They can create the shares and sell them tomorrow, but they can't do it now because those markets are closed. So that creates this kind of an outcome, and you'll see this on a lot of different instruments. You'll see this on gold. You'll see this on currencies, where their markets trade all night long. So when our market opens up, it has to catch up with price, with price action that has occurred the night before. So it's a, it's a, again, it's a different animal. It's a different beast. It's something to pay attention to. I chose this picture specifically for Las Vegas. It seems so appropriate to, uh, to, to be here in Las Vegas. Um, the, uh, there's a class where there's an inherent drag on your performance in ETFs. So let's look at those. So the first idea are these leveraged ETFs, which we talked about earlier. So a leveraged ETF is designed to create some multiple of the daily performance of an index. They use options or derivatives or, or debt to lever up the trade. Simple idea is debt. If the guy, if, you know, if I've got $1,000 in my fund, I buy $1,000 of the stocks, now I'm tracking the index perfectly. If I take my $1,000 and borrow $1,000 and buy $2,000 worth of it, now I've got a performance that will, that will be a levered performance of the underlying. So that's, those are the things that are done. They're usually, they're available in both bullish and bearish directions, and they're usually 2 or 3x, or 200% or 300%. Those are the two ratios. And there's an inherent problem here. Notice that I've got the word daily underlined here. And this, I, this is inherently leads to what's called leverage drag, which can hurt these ETFs over the longer run. So take an example of uh, an imaginary index that's at 100, an index fund, a plain vanilla index fund that's at $100 a share and a 2x levered fund that's also at $100 a share. And we've, got, we've stopped the world. It's right at the beginning point of trading. And now day one goes by. And I'm going to use a dramatic example. But day one goes by, and the index rose 5%. Holding those shares in our index funds mean it rose 5%. And our 2x leveraged fund, since it held twice as much of the stuff, it rose 10%. Straightforward, no big deal. But what happens if on day two, the index falls back to 100? It's a very interesting outcome, and it's just a result of the arithmetic of this process. If the next day the index falls back to 100, that's a decline of 4.76%. So our plain vanilla index fund declines 4.76%. And our 2x levered fund declines 9.52%. 9.52% from 110 brings me to 99.53. And so in a simple two-step, I'm down on my levered ETF, where I'd be at break even on the plain vanilla one. So the lesson here is that I'll just continue this out to a five period one. And so in my little five period example, I'm down 1% on my levered fund when the index is unchanged. The point is this idea that when markets are choppy and sideways, there's this drag on the value of an ETF. And you can see them slowly degrade in their value. This is hap 
if anybody's following the, followed the natural gas ETF, this has happened to a great degree in the natural gas ETF for a different reason. And that's the other point I want to make about this drag. So that's the first notion, daily leverage drag. Commodity ETFs present yet another curveball for us. So first off, commodity ETFs, there's usually sort of three kinds that you can find out there. There are the, those that hold the actual commodity. There are those that use futures markets to achieve the performance of the commodity. And there are those that, that hold the stocks of the producers of the economy. Gold is a good example. So the producers would be the gold miners. So there's some gold miner ones. I'm not talking about those. We're talking about the commodity ETFs, those that, that either hold the, the metal or the, the, the actual commodity or that uh, use futures. Generally, it's only the precious metals that are available in the actual physical holding form. Gold, silver, platinum, palladium, uh, uh, but not copper, for example. And that's simply because of the cost of storage. If this speaker was full of gold coins, I should have done a little math and tried to figure out what that was, but I'm going to say that's a million dollars. Anybody got a better guess? I don't know. It's probably something like, let's just call it a million bucks. But if this was full of corn, I'd have about three bucks worth of corn. And that's the point. Storing corn or wheat or pork bellies, all these other kinds of commodities, has all sorts of costs. For one, to store large values requires lots of square inches. There's also spoilage and risk and transportation issues, whereas gold and silver can sit in the form of gold bars in a vault and go nowhere else, and a lot of value can be on a few shelves. So it's only the precious metals that are typically available. And it's those, therefore, that can't store it, but that use futures markets where the problem crops up. And it's what's called negative roll or negative roll yield. And it comes about because of and I, the word is not important, but it comes about when a, when a futures market is in contango. And I just like to use the word. Um, it's just the normal way futures markets are. When a, mar when a futures market has the closest month at one value, so I'll use corn, and I'll say corn 620 a bushel. If the next month delivery is 620 a bushel, and two months out after that it's 640 a bushel, and then further out it's 660 a bushel, that's called a contango market, where further out delivery months cost more. So picture this, the, the, the trader the, using the futures markets to get the performance of corn. But I can't buy the corn, I've got to use the futures markets. So what I do is I buy some of this, mark, some of this month, some of this month, and some of this month. And then as the most one is, is the closest one approaches delivery date. I don't actually want to take delivery, so I liquidate. And when I liquidate, I buy the, the, the furthest out contract again. So I'm always adding at this higher contangled price and then liquidating down at spot. And that process of continually rolling out the most recent contracts drags my performance down as well. So the same thing happens there. So in the long run, over the long term, Gold, uh, uh, any futures-oriented ETF can drag and not achieve the performance. The precious metals ones, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, they hold the metal, they don't have that problem. Another item to be aware of, some of these aren't actually funds. If it's an ETF, they hold the assets in a segregated account through a bona fide financial instru in instrument. It's, it's, it's audited and everything, but there's another category that are called exchange-traded notes. Exchange-traded notes are simply promises to give you the return of the underlying thing, whatever it is. These are debt, but there's no subordination. There's no status on a liquidation at all. It's a promise to pay that is unsecured entirely. There are... Um, uh, Lehman Brothers, when it went belly up, if you want to Google this, Lehman Brothers closed down, uh, Lehman Brothers e exchange traded note. They had a couple of them, small amounts of money in them, but nonetheless, they went from trading at an NAV on Friday of let's say $22 a share to being worth exactly zero on Monday. 
because they folded up shop and declared bankruptcy and were insolvent and they were never gonna pay off that, that, e, that ETN. ETNs solve some of the problems that we've talked about. It can take away the contango problem. It also introduces the ability to use strategies on obscure indexes. Many of them are in the ETN form. Some of them are even strategic pairs of indexes. So for instance, one of them is uh, long gold short stocks. So if you think long gold short stocks has a role in a portfolio position, I, you know, I'm surprised because to me that doesn't have a role in a portfolio position. Um, you want to make that as a speculative short term trade, that's one thing, but it's not a holding. Um, but those are the kinds of things you see in the ETN world and I just, you know, it's one of those things you want to look out for. Let me finish with a look at this idea of what can happen in stressed markets and what happened back in that, in that August of last year day. So on that day, there was heavy selling pressure for the Monday opening. The Dow was down 1,000 points in the first few minutes of trading. Um, the, the many, many stocks were halted from order imbalances. Yet, the ETFs were being quoted by market makers. But by being, they were being quoted with unknown prices in some of these underlying stocks. So guess what happens in that situation? Well, spreads widen dramatically. And market makers drop their bids way down because they're unclear on what the arbitrage might be. And prices drop down automatically and spreads become like this. And so prices, uh, uh, immediately traded at very huge different prices from where they closed, in large part because you and I traded against that environment. Much of this was caused by stop orders being executed or people panicking and selling a position and not paying attention to the fact that this spread was so far away and that there were stocks that were closed. Here's just some examples. Um, here I've got three S&P 500 ETFs, IVV, VOO, and SPY. They're all S&P 500. And this just shows you the order imbalance right at the opening on that day. It was basically eight, to one, eight or six to one sell orders over buy orders, buy, sell orders for these ETFs that were coming in from us. Here's another ad, a way to look at the liquidity. On August 24th, in the first minute, the bid size was about 600 shares, the ask size was about seven or 800 shares. In the first three minutes and in the first 15 minutes, it was still down at these relatively low numbers. And that compares to, just as an example, what you would have seen if you just looked at a similar period a month earlier. The period from July 13 to 17 shows you more typical where there was twice the amount of liquidity on those books to handle it. So when, the, when liquidity on the book drops and people start selling, that, that moves the price down even more easily and more readily. This is, just, this is a depiction that just shows, again, how far away from the NAV, from the net asset value that some of these might have traded. This, is a, this chart is a little bit difficult to digest. But here, this one is, is really easy, and it just shows you that in the first 15 minutes of trading, prices were way far away from the actual net asset value of the, of the ETF, but that they very rapidly recovered. And so these prices came right back and they were, they were within minutes not trading at dramatic um, uh, discounts. So look, I started off with what in retrospect was probably somewhat of a rhetorical question. Are, are, are ETFs for investors or for traders? They give us the benefits of index funds. We get asset class diversification, low cost, index correlation. Those are aspects of a sound long-term investment, a component uh, of a portfolio. But they give us interday trading, stop orders, margin, leverage, short selling, options. So we can do all of those things. And those are all benefits for traders. And so I'm going to say, and probably many of you realize this, it's both. It really is both. These are remarkable instruments. I use leverage ETFs to trade the market, to hold, to make a position that I trade for two or three days. But my IRA account is diversified across large cap, small cap, foreign, US, some bonds, some stocks, et cetera. And I've got ETFs there too. So 
it plays both roles. It plays both roles very efficiently. Um, and for that reason, the assets that have continued to flow into these is enormous. But for the exact same reason, it's created all these pitfalls and these potholes. Because as the industry has tried more and more to show how nifty they can make this particular index or this particular different approach, like smart beta or currency hedging or equal weighting, the outcome is something that's a very different animal and can create a misstep for you if you don't verse yourself in these, some of the buzzwords that I was trying to show you. It's 1.15. I was told by the moderator uh, five minutes ago that I had five minutes to go, and so it is there. Um, at 1.30, I'm going to be doing a uh, presentation in our, in our booth. I'm gonna go, we're going to look back at the market uh, from a technical standpoint and take a look at where we stand um, technically. I don't know what I'm going to find. We'll take a look at some charts and, and see what they say. Um, we're also doing a, several promotions. If you want to come visit us at the E-Trade booth, we've got some great promotions for new accounts. We've got an account opening booth out there if you want to sit down and talk to one of our financial consultants. And one thing about E-Trade that I just want to make a, a big point, we're known for trading. I mean, we know that. And those guys out there in, on, in our booth that work on our options desks and work with our active, uh, our active platform, but we also have financial consultants. And I know many people associate that with one of our competitors, like the one that's right next to us. Um, but you want to come in, you want to sit down in a branch, or you want to come in, you want to talk to one of our financial consultants about a diversified plan, managed accounts, setting up a retirement plan, all of that stuff is something that our financial consultants are happy to help you with, too. I see one question there. I'll take one question, but then they're probably going to yank me off by the hook. So, Sure, sure. The, the question was, what about dividends, Dave? Thank you for reminding me. I should have mentioned it. They're passed through. So the, when, when shares of stock are held by an ETF and a dividend is paid into that fund company, they then pass that through to you. Now, their expense, the expenses that they take come out of the income and the cash that they have there. But the, 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 the difference between what the actual yield of the S&P 500 would be, I mean, if, if you look at SPY right now, if you bring up a quote on SPY, you'll see a dividend yield of 2.3% or something like that, which is about pretty precisely close to the dividend of the S&P 500. So they're just passed through. Let's go, folks. I know there's other speakers coming in. Thanks for spending your time with me. Be happy to answer any questions out in the booth. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah.